I'm Joyce Frieden from MedPage Today in Philadelphia at the annual meeting of the Association of Healthcare Journalists. Francis Collins, director of the National Institutes of Health, was a keynote speaker here, and Washington correspondent Emily Walker and I sat down with him after his talk to discuss the NIH's budget, embryonic stem cell research, and whether he thinks human genes should be patented. Dr. Collins, thank you so much for sitting down with us today. It's great to have a conversation. Um, I wanted to start by talking about the budget issue since the 2011 budget was just passed and uh, they, the Republicans and Democrats have unveiled their 2012 and beyond proposals. I wanted you to talk about whether you were happy with uh, how the 2011 budget came out for NIH and what concerns you might have for the future. Well, I recognize this is a very tough time in terms of our country and the deficits that are causing such concern about our future. And so the fact that it was necessary in FY11 uh, to look very hard at everything the government is doing is understandable. Uh, there were moments where I feared that the consequences for NIH were actually going to be quite severe. Uh, when the dust finally settled uh, just last night, <laughs> Uh, it seems that we were asked to take a 1% cut uh, compared to the previous year. 1% of the NIH budget is still a lot of money. That was about $320 million uh, that were re removed uh, from the budget that we'd had the previous year. And that will cause us a good deal of distress in terms of how to manage science, especially because inflation for biomedical research is running at about 3.5%. So we are losing that as well as far as our purchasing power. That means that uh, somebody who comes to NIH with a grant application uh, will have now a lower chance of getting funded than in the past. We will do everything we can to try to preserve the funds for those new grants and especially for early stage investigators who are just getting started. But there's no question that this is going to be a particularly stressful time uh, for the biomedical research community. Uh, so the concerns for the future, are there particular areas? That, that you're worried about for like 2012 and beyond? The, uh... Well, it's clear we're in the midst of an intense national discussion about where our investments uh, should lie. I'm gratified to hear from the president repeatedly how important it is uh, to focus on innovation uh, because that is our future in terms of stimulating the economy and keeping America in a very competitive position with regards to the rest of the world, which is going to be good for our nation. So when the president talks about areas that he wishes to be sure uh, we invest in, even at the time that we're having to rein in deficits, uh, he's repeatedly mentioning medical research. I think that's a very justifiable position to take. Medical research also has not been a partisan issue in the past, and I don't see any likelihood that it should become so in the future. So. We are ready to be judged by what we deliver, and we can deliver both in terms of healthcare advances that will help people live long and healthy and productive lives, and we can deliver on economic growth and American competitiveness. Well, speaking of what you can deliver, you talked when you took over at NIH, you were talking about making it easier for discoveries to go from the bench to the bedside. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to ask about how that effort was going, uh, particularly with the uh, new Innovation Center mm -hmm. and, um, and some of the criticisms you mentioned, you mentioned before that there was a misunderstanding that some of these efforts are in competition with drug companies. Right. I am very excited about the potential to speed up the process in going from basic science discoveries about life and how it works and how sometimes disease occurs to those clinical applications that are going to provide benefit in prevention and in treatment. And that is a long and difficult pathway, the so-called translational steps, uh, the bench to the bedside, uh, often take many years and often are very prone to fail along the way. I believe, and many others uh, agree with this, that the time is right to look at that translational pathway uh, in a more creative fashion and see whether there are innovations that could be applied to speed it up and to improve the chances of success. That's what this new National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences aims to do. It's a modest investment at the beginning. It's actually created simply by pulling together components that NIH is already funding, but making them into an integrated whole with a much more specific mission. 
Uh, we'd love to see that mission grow, but even if budgetary constraints prevent that from happening right away, this is the right thing to do. This is not turning NIH into a drug development company. This is actually turning NIH into a more effective, innovative engine for assisting drug development, whether it's being done in academia or in the private sector, to be more successful. And our supporters, uh, both in universities and in companies, see this as a really good moment uh, for this kind of thing to happen. Couldn't have really happened five years ago. If we waited five years, it would be too late. Emily. Well, there have been some concerns expressed about um, researchers who are funded by the NIH having um, potential conflicts of interest, mm -hmm. consulting relationships, or outside investments with companies that could either be competing with the NIH or kind of doing the same thing. Um, what are your thoughts on the NIH's roles on conflicts of interest, and do you think anything needs to be changed in that regard? Conflict of interest is a very serious issue. Uh, we would not want anything to be done that would decrease the public's confidence uh, in what NIH supports because uh, that could be long-lasting in terms of its impact, and we would want the science that we support to be above reproach. You don't, however, want to discourage academic investigators with NIH grants uh, from talking to companies, because in many ways our future depends upon partnerships uh, of that sort. But those partnerships cannot be contaminated by financial conflicts, or questions will arise about whether judgment was affected. Uh, NIH has been in the process of putting together a whole new set of guidelines for how conflicts of interest have to be reported, uh, reviewed, uh, and managed. And those will apply uh, to all of our grantees and will put new responsibilities on them and their institutions uh, to review these kinds of circumstances and to make sure that they fit within accepted norms. Uh, we are very close now to having that new system uh, in place. How close? Uh, within, I think, the next year, uh, you will see a new system. Uh, it will, I'm afraid, uh, place an additional administrative burden upon investigators and institutions to keep track of all of this. Uh, and there will need to be bodies uh, sort of reviewing it who are objective, who can decide whether a particular relationship is acceptable or not. But I don't see that we have any choice. Uh, we can't afford uh, to lose the public's confidence. We can't afford to have examples appear where somebody was involved in a result that looks as if it was affected by their financial conflicts. Uh, the public won't put up with too many of those before they begin to suspect that the whole enterprise is flawed. And I can tell you, even without these more onerous guidelines, the vast, vast majority of investigators are really careful about this, as are their institutions. But we want to be sure that there are not uh, awful exceptions that sneak through uh, by putting in place uh, more effective oversight. Mm -hmm. Well, this week marks an important anniversary. It's the 10th anniversary of the completion of the mapping of the human genome, an effort which you led. Um, can you briefly talk about some of the most significant advances in your mind um, that that project has led to and areas where you feel um, that it hasn't yet fulfilled its promise? Certainly when it comes to the way in which we do biomedical research, the success of the Genome Project has utterly changed things uh, in an uh, almost <laughs> unbelievable way. If you talk to a graduate student today who's working in any area of human biology, they can't even imagine how anybody did research without having the human genome sequence available with the click of the mouse because you use it many times a day in order to advance whatever you're working on, whether it's cancer or heart disease or diabetes or rare disease, a common disease. Genomics has become sort of the center of the center in the way people approach problems in the research lab. In the clinic, it has certainly had some significant impacts. Uh, take, for instance, this test that tells a woman whether she needs chemotherapy after having a breast cancer diagnosis, uh, which is now being used by 50,000 women in the U.S. and will prevent many of them from having to go through chemotherapy because the test will show they don't need it. Uh, take, for instance, the ability to identify who's at really high risk for colon cancer if they're in a family history situation where others have had that disease in order to find out whether they need special, uh, careful attention from colonoscopy. Uh, there are real implications for real people. For drugs, for instance, we now have some drugs for which a genetic test is a critical part of the prescription to be sure that's the right drug at the right dose for you. But I think it's still fair to say that most of the genomic medicine promise hasn't yet had an effect on most people. Uh, that is coming. I'm not surprised it's not here yet. 
there's this old saw about technology is that we always underestimate its long-term effect and overestimate its short-term effect. And I think that happened with genomics. I suspect in another 10 years, uh, nobody will ask this question, are you disappointed <laughs> about whether the genome project affected medicine? Uh, it'll more be like, wow, did you think it would lead to that? What are your thoughts on companies holding, can, should companies be able to hold patents for human genes? There is a very interesting court debate going on. Uh, the Court of Appeals uh, just heard this uh, case and a very interesting development in that the Department of Justice of the United States sided with the plaintiffs in this case, uh, basically making the case that a sequence of a gene as a composition of matter uh, ought not to be considered as patentable material because it's something that exists within all of us. If it's unmodified in any way, it's basically part of nature and shouldn't be claimed. And that, of course, is a different position than the Patent Trademark Office has been taking for many years. You don't see this very often where two parts of the government uh, come down in front of a court in two different places. <laughs> so it tells you just how complicated and controversial this topic is. Uh, for me, having been at NIH in the midst uh, of the uh, issues about genes and patenting for a long time, um, I would think it would be a good outcome uh, if we find uh, that it, it's possible for gene sequences uh, without any human manipulation uh, to just be in the public domain. And that's certainly what we tried to do with the Genome Project. We gave all the data away every 24 hours, in part uh, to try to put it in the public domain so it no longer would be the subject of a patent claim. And when you consider the consequences of what those patents might mean for the future, I do worry that as each of us gets the chance uh, to find out about our own DNA sequence when the $1,000 genome becomes possible, and we're not far from that, will it be the $1,000 genome with the $200,000 royalty? Because, okay, you sequenced your genome, you owe me because your BRCA1 and a whole long list of other genes were on that list, and so you must have to pay somebody. That doesn't seem like a good plan. Uh, for the full optimal use of genomics uh, for medicine in the future. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Collins. Thanks. Thank nice you so to much. talk to you both. Nice to talk to you.